Hello, and on, <clears throat> and on behalf of the Richardson Chamber of Commerce, uh, our webinar sponsors and our event partners, welcome to Reshoring, Leading the Trend in Evaluating and Reengineering Supply Chains in 2021. This webinar is produced by the International Business Resource Center of the Richardson Chamber of Commerce, and I invite you all to visit our new international division of the Richardson Chamber. Next slide. My name is Lawrence Howarth. Uh, I'm the Director Mayor's Office of International Business, Richardson Economic Development Partnership, Vice President of International Business, Richardson Chamber of Commerce. And here's my colleague, Beth Coleman. Thank you, Lawrence. My name's Beth Coleman. I'm the Director of Economic Development. And on behalf of the Richardson Chamber and its International Business Resources Committee, welcome again to this very informative webinar. Next slide. And to make this webinar a success, we rely on sponsors. Our headline sponsor today is Seville. CPAs and advisors, Seville's international tax and accounting experts believe borders should not be barriers to success. So again, thanks very much to Seville. And uh, if you look on your slide, you'll see the services that they provide. We also would like to thank our other sponsors, BAL, Barry Appleman and Leiden Law Firm, Scansa, Construction and Development, Cows and Thompson Attorneys, the Tassipoulos Law Firm, and Stinson Law Firm. Thank you again to all sponsors. We also are pleased to have quite a few event sponsors for this webinar, and their logos are listed on your webinar registration page. So thanks again for everyone's help in producing and promoting this webinar. Great. Thank you, Beth. Let me introduce you to Harry Moser. Uh, Harry is the president and founder of the Reshoring Initiative. Uh, as one of the foremost authorities in reshoring and supply chain reengineering, as president of machine tool maker GF Machining Solutions, winner of many awards in his field, an active participant in the 2012 White House Insourcing Forum, and a member of the Department of Commerce Investment Advisory Council, Harry is frequently quoted and interviewed in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and other national media. He is an MIT engineering grad and an MBA from the University of Chicago. He has a wealth of knowledge in this area, all around great guy. Please welcome Harry Moser. <laughs> Uh, th thank you, Lawrence uh, and Beth. It's good, very good to be here. Gr it's been great to work with you and make put this together. And thanks, as you said, to all of our sponsors. Uh, to, to give you a little background from a Texas viewpoint, uh, Texas uh, over the years from 2010, when reshoring really got going until 2020, the, when you compare the states for the total number of jobs brought back in reshoring and FDI, foreign direct investment, uh, Texas was number two uh, behind South Carolina, but a, a very solid uh, number two. And, you know, my hope is that with your cooperation, we're going to make Texas uh, number one going forward. Give you a little history on me. I, I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and, and uh, New Jersey, you see here in an old map, is right across the river from uh, New York. And the, the first settlers in New Jersey were in 1660. My ancestors built the Crane Estate. I'm Harry Crane Moser. So they built, built the Crane Estate starting in 1670. So you can see the, the old building there. And the th that ancestor was Stephen Crane. One of his relatives, another Stephen Crane, wrote The Red Badge of Courage, which many of us read in high school. It was, it was It's considered to be the first um, American novel of any kind. This is my grandfather, Henry Crane, and he grew up in that Crane estate and uh, uh, was born there, eventually passed away there. 
uh, and he worked for the local gas utility. Uh, he started as a plumber at the age of 17, retired at 83, looking something like this. He was then on the board of directors and secretary of the corporation. So very successful career. And his best customer was Singer Sewing Machine. And this is the Singer plant. It was the, the flagship for Singer. In its day, this factory around 1900, 1910, was the largest single factory of any kind in the world. 2.5 million square feet, 5,000 workers. And that'd be a big factory today. But back then, it was the biggest factory in the world. And my uh, father ran about a third of it, Ray Moser. His father was a foreman there. I worked there summers in high school and college. And I went past 20 years ago and nothing of Singer is made there anymore. As far as I can tell, everything everything they make is imported. And, and I thought then on the companies that I tried to sell machine tools to and foundry equipment to and company after company, industry after industry disappeared, wiped out by imports wiped out by offshoring. And I, I cried then for what uh, our, our city, our state, the country, all, all of us have lost uh, in terms of the, the impact of offshoring of imports on our domestic economy. And, and the data is clear on this. This shows manufacturing output plateauing at least the last uh, 10 or 12 years, 20 years. And, and I think in reality, uh, it's actually declined. If you counted pounds, tons of steel, number of castings, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that, that the, num the numbers are down because we've lost so much of both the components and the final assembled product to, to imports. And as a result, manufacturing share of, of the GDP has been cut in half. But it isn't that we're not consuming goods. Everybody says we're not a we're not a goods society anymore. We're a services society, but th that's not literally true because you can see here that our our personal consumption of goods has risen at about two and a half percent per year for the last twelve years, which is faster than the rate of growth of the GDP. So we're consuming increasing amounts of goods, probably increasing as faster faster than services. The only difference is we're not producing enough of them anymore. So you see here that the uh, goods trade deficit, so the uh, exports minus the imports, which was positive, positive trade balance until about 1980, turned then turned negative and has basically continued on down until plateauing roughly in the last 10 years, which is a time in which reshoring has uh, surged. As a result of that overall long trend, manufacturing jobs as a percentage of U.S. employment have been cut from 27% to about 9%. And when you put those last couple of slides together, you see a very strong correlation between uh, the trend in the trade deficit and the trend in the uh, manufacturing employment. So it's it's, it's clear to, to all uh, informed observers who analyze it, that the, the imports, the trade deficit is, is the leading cause of the decline in manufacturing employment in the United States. Then you say, okay, why such a big trade deficit? And the, the primary reason is price, is that the U.S. price level is uh, not competitive overall, that we are... Mm, 10 to 20 percent higher than most of the developed countries like Germany, Japan, South Korea, and 40 percent higher than China, India, places like that. And when we, we did a survey about three, four years ago with Plant Moran, one of the biggest auditing and consulting companies, and we asked manufacturers and distributors, why do you import? Why do you get the materials that you do, the components that you do offshore instead of domestically? And over, overwhelmingly, they said price was the reason. And if it wasn't directly price, then it was something like unavailable. Well, why is it, why is it unavailable today in the U.S. when 30 or 40 years ago, almost everything was available here in the U.S.? That's because the lower priced imports drove the domestic uh, companies out of the business and therefore it's no longer available. So we say overall, at least 70% of the decision 
to go offshore is due to price. And if you don't solve that price problem, companies will continue to go offshore. Fortunately, there has been progress. We talk about reshoring by U.S. companies. Some people call it onshoring, means the same thing. So it means to once again meet the demand of a market by producing in the market rather than producing somewhere else and shipping to the market. Uh, also, FDI, foreign direct investment, exactly the same logic, but a foreign headquartered company uh, making that same decision to uh, produce in the market for the market. So the difference is reshoring could be General Motors and FDI could be Toyota or Siemens, something like that. Some people talk about localization, meaning producing near the consumer. Uh, there's also uh, nearshoring. So nearshoring would be to bring the work back from a foreign or, or long distance offshore source, think, think Asia, India, something like that, and instead produce at a nearshore, think uh, Mexico or Canada from the U.S. perspective. And my, my first priority by far is to bring the work back to the U.S. But if that cannot be done, then we'd rather have it come to Mexico or Canada uh, rather than staying at the greater distance. And of the Mexico or Canada, Mexico offers significant advantages because the the wage rates in Mexico are lower than they are in China. And Mexico's right here, right next door to Texas. And, and therefore, the logistics and all the complications are dramatically reduced. So, uh, and from a U.S. viewpoint, it's nice that the product coming out of Mexico on average has about 40, that's 40% U.S. content, whereas product out of China has about 5%. So, so my first choice, again, bring it to the U.S., but if you can't get it here because there's too much labor content, not automatable, et cetera, then Mexico or Canada are excellent uh, choices. The, the, as I mentioned, the trend has turned favorable. Uh, we chart here the uh, annual number of jobs brought back either by reshoring by U.S. headquartered companies or FDI by foreign headquartered companies. And the sum of the two in the year 2010 was about 6,000. And the sum of the two in the year 27, about 2017 was about 185,000, driven uh, significantly in that year by the uh, tax and regulatory cuts. And then things fell off in 2018 and 2019, primarily, we believe, due to the trade war. Companies didn't know what tariffs would apply to what products, from what countries, for how long, at what rate. Everything was uncertain. Companies don't like uncertainty, and therefore they stopped making important investment decisions. Things slowed down. Then in 2020, fortunately, things picked up, at least for reshoring. Uh, FDI did not pick up all over the world. It's continued down. But uh, for reshoring, it, it picked up uh, to a record level. You can see the blue line is the highest it's been, reached 109,000 manufacturing jobs in 2020. And that, that was driven significantly by COVID, either directly by COVID, like uh, masks, gowns, gloves, penicillin, things like that, or indirectly by you know, companies in other industries seeing what had happened to the uh, companies and the products in the medical industry and seeing the impact of being not self-sufficient, not resilient, and therefore these other companies saying, wow, I saw what happened to them. I don't want that to happen to us. We better start reshoring. So some factors, other factors that have driven this is rising labor cost in China. China's obviously been the 800 pound gorilla on all this. And this chart shows indexed unit labor costs for a variety of countries starting in 2000, going through 2020. And so each year the, the value is adjusted by the change in wage rate, the change in productivity, and the change in currency of the other country relative to the US. So you can see US, the red line has been stable uh, no, no, essentially no change. Uh, other countries bounce around with currency. China's way up here. So China uh, is about five times as high a unit labor cost today as it was 20 years ago. And that's <clears throat> largely due to their one child policy, which has caused their workforce to drop by about 3 million a year. So the supply of labor is coming down, the demand of labor is going up because their economy has grown so fast. Therefore, 
uh, the wages have gone up. So that, that's good. It, good for them. Their incomes go up and good for us because they're not as competitive anymore. Now, some other reasons that have influenced the trend back. Uh, E-commerce. Uh, you order something from Amazon or anywhere else, and you expect it today, tomorrow. And if there's a surge in those orders and the distribution center stocks out, and if the product has to be surface freighted in from Asia, that can be eight weeks, 10 weeks to get the thing here, especially today. Uh, and whereas if the product's coming in from a local supplier, could be a couple of days. So a huge difference in ability to respond to, to dynamic demand. Uh, automation has helped to make the U.S. more uh, competitive, uh, overcoming some of the economic disadvantages of, of higher wage rates. The Trump tariffs, love them or hate them, certainly made the imported Chinese products more expensive. Um, pe increasingly, people prefer a made in USA product. Uh, Demon. Uh, the, the the godfather of of the quality movement has helped the U.S. be uh, quality competitive. Lean uh, helps companies be be more efficient and effective. So what we've seen uh, was driven by the COVID, as I mentioned. So the uh, at night or all day all day long during the height of the epidemic, we saw month after month of doctors and nurses saying. I can't get masks, I can't get gloves and gowns, I'm wearing them multiple days, I'm at risk of dying, my patients are at risk of dying from this, this is unacceptable. So, so the medical industry has understood the problem. Also pharmaceuticals, we found out we were very dependent on, on China and India for pharmaceuticals. But other industries have exactly the same situation or worse, rare earth minerals, we, we produce almost none and even what we produce we send to China to be processed. The, the 5G problem, uh, discrete uh, electronic components. We import about 97% of the apparel and footwear that we consume. The machine tool industry that I come out of, very dependent on, on imports. Even, even the Defense Department, uh, an industry category in which Texas and Dallas are very strong, uh, the Defense Department every year or two puts out a report uh, describing the products, the components, the materials that it cannot get, just plain cannot get in the United States anymore, and that it has to either go to our allies, hopefully, or in some cases, our adversaries to provide. And that's obviously not a good long-term situation for uh, our Defense Department. So the, the companies have, have seen this condition, and survey after survey has shown uh, a significant desire or plan to Reshore. So this is one done by BDO, another consulting company, which said that uh, about 24% of companies were planning to relocate uh, their supply chain, meaning their manufacturing, to another country. And of the 24, 22 said plan to reshore to the U.S. Now, that's uh, that doesn't mean shut down all my factories offshore. It doesn't mean shut down all of my suppliers offshore but it means at least some of those components to, to so relocate. Another study shows significant plans by companies to, to change the 62% planning reshoring and some indication of which, company, which industries are most likely to do so. As a result of all this, companies think back over the last couple of decades and, and the disruptions to their supply chain, to their just-in-time capabilities. And so the uh, Japanese uh, Fukushima tsunami, the, the COVID crisis, the Thai floods that stopped product coming out of Thailand, the Icelandic volcano that for several weeks stopped air freight coming in from Europe, the Suez Canal blockage just a couple of weeks back, uh, our own LA dock strike. All these things stop product coming in from uh, uh, literally offshore, the product that has to come in from uh, across, across the ocean. And so the uh, companies look at this and say, well, if I've got 100 products coming in from around the world, there's 100 chances 
of something going wrong. In each case, it might not be a very high probability, but collectively, that's a significant probability that I will not be able to assemble my product timely. So increasingly, com companies are saying, well, one good solution, supply the U.S. market from an assembly plant located in the U.S., and ideally with the suppliers and the various tiers of the supply chain located, nestled close to the assembly plant, like the like the new automotive factories typically do, and and if not if not in the same city, at least in the same state or in the country, or at least in North America, so that you avoid all those issues associated with other countries with with uh, getting across the ocean, with getting through the port, etc. Um, so here's a, a study that came out of Europe uh, estimating how frequently there will be supply chain shocks. And they said um, every approximately five years, this is 4.9, so five years, uh, there'll be a disruption of about two or greater months. And they concluded that when that severe disruption occurs, that companies will lose something like a year's annual profit. So, so the, the kind of things that keep uh, CEOs and CFOs up, up at night. So companies say, damn, I, I, I hate to have that happen. It worries me. I can't sleep. But the U.S. is too expensive. It's just too expensive here. I, I'm saving so much money by buying the product in these low wage countries that that I, I've got to put up with it because I, I, can't, I can't afford to bring it back. And we say that's not necessarily true. If you'll stop looking at just the price, the X works price or the FOB price, and instead look at the total cost of ownership, the, the TCO, and I'm going to go into that in some detail. So the reality is that the survey says about 60% of manufacturers look only at uh, the wage rate or the uh, purchase price, the FOB price, X works price, the landed cost, which would be that price plus maybe duty and freight. And with any of those, they're missing 10, 20, 25% of the total cost of offshore products. And therefore they're deciding to import product that it would be in their own uh, self-interest to reshore. So as an example of this, we have online on our website, the uh, TCO, Total Cost of Ownership Estimator. And you can it's free to use. You go in, you sign up, you sign in, you use it, you answer a series of questions comparing the U.S. source to the offshore source. And here's an example of, of, of one of those cases. The uh, offshore China price, unit price for a product, whatever it was, was $70. And for the U.S. was 100 So the procurement person, the, the supply chain person, looks at that and says, wow, that's 30% difference, $30. I'm going to buy 12,000 of those a year for the company. So that's $360,000 worth of purchase price variance savings to the company. That's a third of my objective for the year. I'm going to get my bonus. I'll get promoted. Life's good. But if they look at total cost and see that the total cost for China is, is 98 and U.S. is 108. So now there's only 10% difference instead of 30% difference. And in two or three years, if the wage rates continue to go up as they have, the Chinese total cost will be lower, will be higher than the U.S. level. Then hopefully the company will say, well, this new, this new model we have coming out really does not make sense to offshore because we're going to offshore it now and bring it back in three years. And there is a transitional cost of moving the tooling, moving people, intellectual property left over there, et cetera. So why don't we just not send that one? And why don't we start thinking about the product we've got offshore that pretty soon it's going to be more cost effective to be here. And when we need new tooling, uh, when we have a design change, when whatever happens, uh, let's, let's just uh, bring it back here home and uh, simplify life and be, be protected for the future. So to show you the impact of this, uh, I took the first 180 cases comparing China to the U.S., where users had gone in, done the TCO calculation, and uh, this chart shows in the horizontal axis the China price 
as a percentage of the U.S. price. So the blue line is, represents price. Uh, to the left of 100, uh, the Chinese price is lower. And to the right, the Chinese price is higher than the U.S. price. You can see the, the high point here is around 70%. And the about 8% of the cases, the U.S. had the lower price. But when for the exact same cases, switching to TCO, in 32% of the cases, the U.S. had the lowest TCO, the, the best offer. And if there happened to be a, a Trump 15% tariff, then 46% of the cases, the U.S. wins. So the, the point of this is that is that by doing the math correctly, just by doing that, not by investing more, not by you know redesign, I mean, just doing the, the absolute simplest thing, which is doing the math, somewhere between something like 20% of the work that's now offshore can be brought back and actually on average increase company profitability. If you do other things like automation, skilled workforce, training, lean, et cetera, then even greater percentages can be recovered. So the purposes of TCL for bigger companies, those who do import is to help them buy and site, meaning where do you put your factory smarter for the suppliers, for the, supply chain for the contract manufacturers, people who make pumps and motors and sell them to the bigger ones, is to sell smarter, to convince the OEMs that local makes sense. The same logic is applicable to all countries. So if there's any of you who are working with Mexico, the same logic can work for Mexico as works for the United States. To give you a couple of examples of this, mainly in the local Dallas-Fort Worth region. Um, GM bringing work back from Mexico to Arlington. Vistaprint work from Netherlands to Dallas. Now this is foreign direct investment in this case. Ultravision LED lighting. There's been a lot of LED lighting uh, being reshored to the US. My favorite case throughout the country is Mori Corp, M-O-R-E-Y. They're an uh, EMS company. They make printed circuit boards and various assemblies from that uh, located outside Chicago. And two interesting stories. One, they had a housing that they had been importing from China. They had a problem with it. And I, I'm thinking leaked, but I don't know what it was. Uh, but they were forced to find a U.S. supplier. And when they did that, they, they audited and they said, wow, our inventory of the component was cut by 94% because we didn't have to have big piles of the stuff because we didn't know when the container would arrive or what the quality was going to be. So 94% reduction in inventory would pay for an awful lot of reshoring. Uh, second thing, they, they came to me about five years ago and they said, Harry, we're about to lose a really big order to a Chinese competitor that's offered a lower, lower price. And so I helped the, the company uh, do the TCO calculation from the customer's perspective. They took it to the customer, and I have a letter from them saying that that was the key to winning a $60 million order by helping the customer see that even though Mori's price was higher, the total cost for Mori was lower. So in addition to these sort of raw economic things, I, I believe that reshoring is the key to solving many of the biggest problems in the United States. I believe manufacturing jobs with career potential is that solution. So specifically for the last year and a half, we've, we've seen the, prop, the disadvantaged inner city populations issues, the problems that they have. And I was watching a, a documentary on television and a, a young uh, gang leader, young fellow uh, was asked, why did you go in the gang? And he said, $12 an hour. And they said, what do you mean? I could not find a job for $12 an hour. And, and today in, in the Dallas region, a, an apprenticeship at a tool and die shop or a machine shop probably starts at $13, $14, $15 an hour. So there's, there are better alternatives for people. Uh, we've had the rural uh, opioid epidemic impacting you know, significant portions of the white population and the uh, because mainly caused by uh, company uh, towns where, where the, the main employer disappeared 
due to, due to imports, due to offshoring and resulting depression. Uh, uh, we expect a lot of unemployed uh, coming out of retail and believe a really good solution would be to take vacant strip malls and put clean, relatively small manufacturing facilities into them and employ the local population to have them make the product they used to sell. Uh, the U.S. has significant budget deficit problems. And we, we've had six significant problems for 10 or 20 years, but now they're looking a lot worse. And the best solution for that would be millions of manufacturing jobs brought back all those people you know, off of not needing uh, safety net, uh, working, paying taxes, their employers paying taxes, significant reductions in the budget deficits. So uh, in addition, from a societal viewpoint, I know that in manufacturing, one of the absolute biggest problems is skilled workforce availability. It's, it's always tough. It's especially tough now. And by letting the society, the guidance counselors, the workers, the parents, the students see, huh, work isn't going away to China anymore. It's coming back from China. Therefore, manufacturing is a good career. Yes, Susie, if you want to become a welder, become a welder. That's a great idea. Uh, global uh, pollution significantly reduced when you shift from making something in China or India and shipping it here and instead make it here. Um, we believe you can have both significant increases in productivity, higher wages and manufacturing employment increases as long as you actually reshore and bring back that 5 million jobs, which again is about a 40%, 40% increase in manufacturing. So there's a lot of things that the community can do, like skilled workforce. A lot that the companies can do, again, skilled workforce, but also automation, taking a longer term perspective. But there's some things the federal government has to do. So we put together the competitiveness toolkit, which has identified a series of policies or actions over here in the first column. And then what would be a good model for that action and what the impact would be on the U.S. price competitiveness. So if you think back on those curves I showed you, as we cut our price, then, then we cut our price and our TCO and those curves shift to the right and more of the area under the curve is to the right of that 100% line and therefore is to the U.S. advantage. So skilled workforce, we believe, is worth at least 5%, maybe 10%. Having a value added tax, like almost every other country does, puts a tax on a product at the border, uh, makes our homegrown product more competitive. Get the dollar down, maybe 20%. Most of the other, many of the other countries have one way or the other uh, work to keep their currencies low. There are a variety of actions that could be taken. Uh, don't expect to do all of them, but you can see that collectively they come out to about 50% or so. And here's a chart that says, depending on how many points you actually implement, how many points you actually reduce U.S. price relative to foreign price, how many millions of jobs will actually come back and what percentage of the uh, trade deficit, goods trade deficit will go away. So, so we think it's very feasible to get to knock out 20 percent, something like that, and bring back three million, four million uh, manufacturing jobs. So uh, we offer uh, strategies and resources to help with supply chain redesign you know, from, from the reshoring initiative, the TCO estimator I've described, um, SBS siting and buying smarter helps OEMs reevaluate reshoring. And we're available to help with that. The ISP import substitution program it helps the uh, supply chain companies, the suppliers, convince the OEMs to uh, buy from them instead of continuing to import. Supply chain gaps is intended mainly for states to, to look at national supply chain gaps, especially for products significantly used in the state, and then find either domestic or more likely the current foreign suppliers and get them to build a factory in the state. We recommend partnering with the manufacturing extension partnerships like like TMAC with the Economic Developers, Chambers of Commerce, the equipment suppliers, all the people that are committed to the same objective and making this uh, happen. 
So as a specific example of that, our <clears throat> import substitution program, you know, importing, import substitution is reshoring. It's making it here instead of bringing it in. And so the way this works, a, um, a company can identify a product that they're really good at making and call it a widget. And, and we'll tell them who the biggest importers are of widgets, where the company is, exactly what they're bringing in, how many tons per year, uh, roughly what they're paying for it, who the offshore suppliers are. And then we'll train the local company to use total cost to convince that importer to buy from the local company instead of continuing to import. So for, for many of the companies out there, the small to medium sized companies, this can be an excellent program. We're, we have it underway currently with MEPs in Illinois, Cleveland, Dayton, New York State. And in uh, Rhode Island, we work with both the MEP and the state economic development organizations. We've had discussions with TMAC. We did some webinars for the Gulf Coast region of TMAC. Love to hear from the statewide TMAC and implement this program. Uh, something else that I think you might be able to take advantage of, uh, we and uh, four other uh, leading manufacturing trade associations each year put on the National Metalworking Reshoring Award. So if you're in metalworking or your clients or friends are in metalworking, and if you or they have reshored, you can apply for this award. The, the link is here at the bottom and the, uh, the winner will be get significant national visibility. And, uh, you know, I hope, I hope one of you will decide to uh, apply. So it's, it's, it's for reshoring, but also for foreign direct investment. So work manu metal working that comes to the U.S. from offshore. So sort of a simple summary, first summary, you might say here, if, if your product, if your strategic success factor is primarily lowest price, if you're making basically the cheapest thing that in the market and that's how you win, then you probably ought to keep getting it from offshore. But if if significantly you depend on fast delivery, quality, leading technology, intellectual property, then a domestic source is more likely to be the correct solution for you. So everybody can help. I, I know there's out there, there's a, a, in the audience, there's accountants and you can encourage use of total costs for buying and selling. So it's, it's a cost measurement methodology is what accountants do. Uh, for the attorneys, you can advise your companies on some of the complications of exiting China because there are significant complications. And best time to advise them is before they go and let them see that maybe it's not the right solution. Generally, consultants uh, using help your companies do lean, use quick response manufacturing to get quicker delivery, use the total cost system, again, free online, help, help, your, help your clients that way. For realtors, to understand relative property. This has a pretty good offering. So uh, the way we see things playing out, uh, the U.S. has a 800, 900 billion per year trade deficit and looks like trillion or more dollar budget deficits going forward. And the combination of those two, I believe many economists agree, is not long-term sustainable. The U.S. will, if, it, if that continues, the U.S. will lose the benefits of having the reserve currency and significant problems, selling our debt, et cetera. So the, we, to, to, we think the best way to solve that is to cut that trade deficit a lot less painful than cutting the budget deficit. And uh, uh, we see several possible outcomes with reshoring. First, the trend the last couple of years has been sort of 150,000 manufacturing jobs per year, which isn't enough because it, there's still some offshoring happening. There's automation happening. So it, it, it's just barely let us increase manufacturing employment over the last 10 years by, I know, 700, 800,000 jobs. Um, we think that with the current awareness and mandates from the government, the number of jobs per year will go up to about 200,000. But there's a limit. There's a 
there's a like a cap on this of maybe 300,000 jobs per year limited by the skilled workforce, even the unskilled workforce. There just aren't enough people available to bring much more work back than say 300,000 per year. So if we want to really get this going, we need the federal government, especially to do the things I mentioned, get the dollar down, uh, aggressive support of apprenticeship programs, have a value added tax or a border adjustment tax, uh, cooperation with allies relative to China, et cetera, and then maybe 400,000 per year. And if, if we do that, the trade deficit ought to be gone in 15 or 20 years. And so that's that's my goal. So I hope, I hope you'll help that happen. Uh, our forecast for 2021 is that the strongest trends will be in the areas that have become so visible and that are being promoted by the Biden administration, the pharma, uh, chips, PPE, rare earth minerals, things like that. PPE alone, I, I, I did some studies on masks. And if we made all the masks that were imported in 2019, it would have taken about 180,000 manufacturing jobs. That was in 2019 before the pandemic. And if we made all the things that were considered necessary to deal with COVID that were imported in 2019, almost half a million jobs per year. This is pre pre-COVID, you know, when things were stable. So so maybe twice that or three times that during the COVID year. So so if we can get those areas going and continue stronger, very nice results. Beginning of industrial policy, we've had what I'll call a de-industrial policy. We've been taking the actions as a country that will weaken uh, manufacturing. Uh, everybody goes to university, almost nobody goes to uh, apprenticeship programs. Dollars too high, uh, corporate tax rates were too high, etc. No value added tax. Uh, ESG, environmental, uh, social, and corporate governance, hopefully will put uh, help, will help companies understand the value of local sourcing, because that is one of the best ways to, to demonstrate ESG. Uh, we see a move towards continued towards two separate trading blocks, uh, U.S. versus China, de possible decoupling. So companies will decide that th to be stable in, in supplying the U.S. market, they need to reshore more. Uh, so we think reshoring an FDI up uh, about 200,000 jobs, a new record for the total of those two trends. So I, I'd like to comment briefly on President Biden's programs. First, his goal is to bring back about 5 million manufacturing jobs, and that's been our goal for about 10 years. So we applaud him on doing that math correctly. Um, and he has programs that will accelerate reshoring, the Buy American uh, program, the uh, Made in America tax credits, offshoring tax penalties, health program, hopefully cut down the medical cost. That's what really counts as cost because that will reduce the cost of benefits, makes our manufacturing costs lower. He's proposed $50 billion for training programs. That's great. Uh, made in America labeling. The U.S. critical supply chain review that came out a week or two back, uh, targeting these critical industries, that'll help. And in general, his, his style will reduce business uncertainty, and that, that certainly is good. On the other hand, he has some proposals that we believe will hinder reshoring. So the uh, uh, Treasurer Yellen has called for a strong U.S. dollar. So uh, it, we would have preferred if she said 20% uh, lower and then strong or stable. Uh, so our fear is that they'll resist uh, having the dollar come down. The minimum wage is uh, increases costs here and de decreases the incentive for, for youth to go into programs like apprenticeships. The higher corporate tax rate redu reduces the after-tax profitability of producing in the U.S., makes other people look, other countries look better. Repeal of the right to work rules. Uh, having college free will make, again, make college more attractive relative to apprenticeship programs. Uh, I, I see the, the administration focused almost so solely on bringing back work that comes into the OEM factory and does not they don't seem to be aware of the fact that most of the work that comes back is outsourced to 
uh, the supply chain within the U.S. And if they ignore that component of it, they're missing a big piece of the pie. So we see pluses and minuses. And, and most important, perhaps, we do not see a focus on improving price competitiveness, on, on taking the actions that will uh, rise all ships because the U.S. is once again uh, cost competitive or price competitive in the world. So this is, uh, I think, a very interesting summary. This fellow at uh, uh, Gartner, uh, market research analytical company, uh, wrote, it's not the type of disruption that determines the supply chain impact. The type of supply chain determines the impact of the disruption. So having a short, solid, local supply chain means in almost all cases that the in the disruption will be much less. So we're a nonprofit with 32 sponsors. Uh, AMT was our founding sponsor. They put on IMTS, the 130,000 person machine tool show in Chicago every other year. You'll recognize some of these uh, others up here. GF was my the company I ran for, for 22 years. A series of other trade associations, excellent groups. Uh, American Electric Power, a utility, uh, JLL uh, real estate broker and related services. So just a, a great, great group of companies, trade associations and others that make us possible for us to do what we do. Uh, this is how we, we think of the world a little bit. Uh, this is um, meant to be the little Dutch boy and little Dutch boys in Holland. And this is the dike which keeps the North Sea out of Holland and the little Dutch boy's wandering along and he sees a hole in the dike and the water's coming through and the little stones are falling out and the big stones are starting to vibrate a little. And he says, wow, this is going to go soon <clears throat> and the dike's going to go and, and the whole village is going to flood and people are going to drown and no food for a year. It's going to be horrible. So he, he says to himself, well, uh, I got to do something and I either go find the village elders and have them fix it. But I, I don't think there's time or I put my finger in the dike and hold it all together. So he, he puts the finger in the dike and and prays. And so uh, conceptually, uh, this is uh, offshoring out here. And this this little guy is is Harry back when Harry had hair and you're the village elders. And if you uh, decide if you say, Harry, well, that's nice of you to come out and do this for Dallas. It was, it was fun, but uh, good luck, guy. Well, then probably things aren't going to get better. But if you take this message back to your company, back to your customers, and your clients, if you tell your, your children and grandchildren that manufacturing is once again a great career, then the city, the region, the state, the country will be better for us, our children, and our grandchildren. So I'm uh, delighted to have had your attention, appreciate your, all of you coming on and staying with us and uh, look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Harry. That was an excellent presentation. Lots of things to think about, lots of uh, educational benefit in, in, uh, in the webinar. We've got a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, is somewhat general, but when you think about uh, TCO, total cost of ownership, you know, it appears to be one of those common sense items, yet we don't see that happening in some companies. What are the hurdles? What's, what's keeping that from happening? What's keeping that analysis from happening? Well, the, the easiest thing to make the decision is to go into the computer, into the ERP system and say, what's the price? You know, what's the FOB price, the factory price? One number, it's a hard number, it's a firm number. Uh, or, or what's the landed cost, which is price, duty, and freight. Again, quite firm. You push a button and bam, you've got your number. Whereas with total cost, there's uh, 29 different factors, some of which are subjective. What's the intellectual property risk uh, for this product out of China uh, versus out of uh, Vietnam, for example, or out of, or out of the U.S., you know, for the, for the base case. And, and so you... It's more work to do TCO, not too much more, but some. And, and, and to the extent that the supply chain person, the procurement person is rewarded based on their results, you've got a, a firm rock to do the analysis on based on price. Whereas with T TCO, if you let them 
do the subjective decisions about what the intellectual property risk was or the natural disaster risk was, well, then they can uh, come up with numbers that make them look like winners, even if they made bad decisions. So, so, so therefore, we, we say we, we know it's hard to convince and enable the procurement person to make the change. It takes the C-suite, it takes the vice presidents and president of the organization to say, this is necessary for our company's stability. This is necessary for Texas and the United States. Let's do the analysis. Uh, let's pick the right products that make sense to come back. So it becomes very strategic. So uh, Harry, another question we have, um, you know, with with bringing some of these uh, these jobs back, bringing some of the manufacturing back, uh, the question is, what about the shipping, importing, longshoring in the ports, inland logistics? What happens to those jobs? Well, there's, I'd say two answers for that. As the U.S. becomes more price competitive, we will export more. And therefore, some of that, some of those people that were busy uh, taking boats off of ships will be busier putting boats onto ships. And they'll have something in them now instead of going back empty. So that, that'll be some of it. But probably more so, right now, a container comes in and it comes to maybe a distribution center and it gets broken up and the product gets shipped out to various uh, stores, let's say around the country. And now in contrast, if the product, if let's say it's a refrigerator, if the refrigerator is made here in the United States, there's going to be hundreds of components that are brought in by freight from all over the country or at least all over the state to the assembly plant to be assembled. And then that refrigerator from there is going to ship from there to maybe a distribution center and then on to the stores. So I, I'm convinced that the total uh, logistical uh, workforce <clears throat> to move all those components in will be greater than what it took to move the container in. And therefore, I think it'll be a net gain. It'll be different jobs, different people, different places in the country, but in net, a, a positive for the country. Interesting. Good. Another question, you know, as we consider reshoring, tell us about the skilled workforce availability. And you touched on this earlier, but uh, we're, we're going to need a, a new set of skills as we do this. Yes, yes and no. There's if you had good skills in the past, if you were a good CNC machine tool operator, a good welder, a good programmer, uh, those skills are still relevant. You have to be upgraded periodically, but but a lot of the skills are, are the same or easily upgradable. There will certainly be, uh, and there are increasingly more robots, uh, more automated equipment, and you need people to program them and uh, maintain them. But the uh, those are generally, most people would say, better jobs. So it should be easier to attract people to become uh, maintainers of robots and programmers of robots rather than uh, people who were tightening lug, lug nuts on an assembly line, for example. So the, the jobs are better. We should be able to attract higher uh, skilled people uh, who, who get trained better and, and overall society is better off. Great. I think we have room for one more question. And that is, um, in your total cost of ownership analysis, uh, you know, especially the last uh, administration, uh, the free trade agreements or the various tariffs, um, you know, have changed. How does the, the how does TCO uh, factor those changes in? Yeah. Uh, in the TCO calculations, it's a, think of it as a spreadsheet. One of, one of the cost items is duty or, or tariffs, and it defaults to 4%, which is a pretty typical number, but it's, it's, uh, it also allows you to put in the actual number. So, so if, if you know, let's say you know that there's a 3% normal duty, and then there's a 25% Trump tariff on the product coming out of China, then you could go in there 
and put in 28 percent so it's uh, so it's up to you I mean, this, the computer will not know that you you have to <clears throat> look the product up there's there's tables on line uh, the u.s international trade representative i think and you can look up by hs code <clears throat> find the china tariff special china, china tariff if any and insert that plus the regular duty into that slot in the TCO estimator. Fantastic. Well, Harry, this has been great. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Beth, can I have you uh, wrap it up for us? Let me, uh, Lawrence, just, just before we do that, I yeah. just wanted to say, first, uh, thank everybody for being here. And, you know, I've got this goal of 5 million manufacturing jobs coming back. And that's tough for me here by myself. And so I need you to get involved and participate. You know, if you've got a possibility at your company or at your client or at your customer, email me and say, Harry, here's an opportunity. Help us, give us some advice. Let's get going on this. And and you know, I, I'd just be delighted to hear from someone here. Thanks. Okay, great. Beth. Oh, you got your your muted. <laughs> Sorry, after a year, you'd think I'd have figured that out by now. But uh, yes, thanks so much, Harry. Um, great, great, relevant, practical information. Um, really appreciate uh, you sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. Um, if those of you who have joined us today are interested in um, a copy of the presentation, please send me an email, beth at richardsonchamber.com. And uh, we'll be putting this recording out on the Chamber's website as well. But please give us a few days to get all the technology uh, taken care of and to get that posted. And on that note, thanks to you again, Harry, and thanks to all of you for joining. Make it a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Bye, Bye everybody.